Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our back in our Father's Word. We're going to finish the book of Jeremiah today. Jeremiah, he whom God launches forth. And God declares in chapter 1 of this great book, and we're in the 52nd now, 52nd, 52 chapters back, God said to Jeremiah, I, I knew you before you were even in your mother's womb, naturally meaning in the first earth age. And I chose you then. But while you were in the womb, I designated you as a prophet. And that's what he uses Jeremiah for, is a prophet. Now, we have come to the closing chapter. Many people think that it is copied from 2 Kings 24 and 25. That's not true. Because this particular chapter goes into more, it's, it's particular and it's more fully concerning the end times. In other words, there's more information in it. And it's there for a purpose. And you want to glean that from it. And we'll do that today. So, um, what, what, so far as we've come down to verse 18, what have we learned in this second witness? If God tells you to do something, even if it's going into captivity to the so-called enemy, king of Babylon, you go. You might say, well, why would he want us to do that? Because God's elect have a, a purpose. It's when the king of Babylon comes of the New Testament, that's to say the book of Revelation, you are to go before him, whereby the Holy Spirit can speak through you. So what we've learned so far, Zedekiah and the king line, the line of Judah, they, they would not listen to God. Thought they could do it better themselves. So problem after problem arose from that. Until finally the king of Babylon just did them in. So it's important that you pick up on that as we continue then into the final verses of the chapter to know that God has a purpose. And that's why this second witness is given. You're supposed to pick up on it. You're supposed to learn from it, that it is talking about the end times. What this whole book was about, this whole prophecy, was to bring you to that point in God's time plan, preparing you for that moment. Let's get right into it and see if we can bring some of those particular points more fully forward than it would be given in Kings, where that you reap that wonderful information. Verse 18, chapter 52, the great book of Jeremiah, and it reads, as they're stripping the city, they're stripping God's temple, they take the cauldrons also, and the shovels, and the snuffers, and the bowls, and the spoons, and all the vessels of brass wherewith they ministered took they away. This is those that handle the ashes from the altar of God, the spoons, the lighters, and so on and so forth. Uh, but this was where God's work was to be ministered. What, look what disobeying God has brought to pass. Nebuchadnezzar left it intact. It, it could function quite nicely. But man would not listen to God. Just because he said, you're going into captivity for 70 years. It's going to be over then, but I have a purpose. They wouldn't listen to God. Now, just as it is in this generation, Antichrist is coming. And you are not to premeditate what you'll say beforehand, but listen to your father. It is important that you discipline yourself in that. It is ever, ever so very important that you discipline yourself in it to listen to God, to listen to God's word, the letter he sent you, and not do what man might want to do, whittle out his own path. Verse 19, 
and the basins and the fire pans and the bowls and the cauldrons and the candlesticks and the spoons and the cups, that which was of gold in gold and that which was of silver in silver, I mean separating it and packing it according to the value, took the captain of the guard away. I mean, they stripped the place. These were the sacraments used in all the liturgical duties of the temple of God. Verse 20, the two pillars. One sea, that is to say there was a, 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 a basin down below that, and 12, base, 12 brazen bulls um, that were under the bases which King Solomon had made in the house of the Lord. The brass of all these vessels was without weight. I mean, it was huge. This, this was, again, uh, the point God wants you to make and know, had they listened to our Heavenly Father, these would all have been left intact. Unfortunately, destroying the house of God, the physical house, it's not that important but not adhering to God's wishes and destroying the spiritual house of God in these end times is very important. Not let that happen. Two pillars. Well, let's think about those pillars. This is very important. 21. And concerning the pillars, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits. And a fillet of 12 cubits did composite, and the thickness thereof was four fingers. It was hollow. In other words, four fingers thick are all the way around, and uh, what is 18? It's bondage. Absolutely bondage. And uh, what does the pillar normally do? It holds the house up. It holds up God's temple. It holds up God's teaching. It holds up God's house, his principles. Verse 22, and a captor of brass was upon it, That's decorating it, looking nice. And the height of one captor was five cubits, which with the network and pomegranates upon the captors round about all of brass. The second pillar also and the pomegranates were like unto these. There were two pillars there just alike. You've got two witnesses for everything in God's word. Always hang on to that. Look for it. One witness won't cut it. In God's word, you need two. Verse 23, and there were 90 and six pomegranates on a side and all the pomegranates upon the network were in hundred round about. Now what, what, 18 cubics high, a hundred pomegranates around the top, decorating it. What does a hundred stand for? It's God's children of promise, God's election. One hundred of them exactly. They are right at the very top of the pillars. This, this should remind you, if you're a scholar of God's Word, of, of the great book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 12. Listen to it. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And that is to say, married, almighty God, considering and taking. You know, God expects his election to be those pillars, to be symbolic of those pillars, to hold up the word of God, to make sure it is published, to make sure that the people of the world hear the real word of God. So here you have the whole situation wrapped up in these columns. The fact that, um, that um, they were in bondage, they were supposed to go in bondage, 
Why? God ordered them in bondage. He even stated back in the 24th chapter, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. He's working for me. And naturally, uh, we know from the 4th chapter of the great book of Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar himself was converted. One of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible to the living God was written by the king of Babylon of old. But that is not the king of Babylon of the end times that we have to deal with. He is none other than the son of perdition himself. And that's why it becomes very important that as one of those pillars, though allowed in bondage, delivered up, being freely allowed for the, uh, the Holy Spirit to speak through you, to overcome anything that Satan might try to sponsor upon our people, it brings freedom. It's written, as you've heard me say many times in Luke 21, it amazes me, even the gainsayers are convinced by what you say at that time because it's not you that speak, but the Holy Spirit speaking through you. What a time to serve God. What a second witness to complete this great book of Jeremiah, to consummate all the teaching, all the events that transpired that lay the groundwork that there's nothing new under the sun. What has been around comes around. Therefore, you know what it is that you're to do. You're certainly not to do as these children did when they disobeyed God. They disobeyed Nebuchadnezzar when they were told to obey him, which was God's word. Then in disobeying Nebuchadnezzar, they disobeyed God. Nebuchadnezzar was not allowed by God to harm them as long as they did what was right. He even wished them well and prospered them and, and hoped they would do well. But oh no, they've got to work the long way and work their way around and try to, try to overcome themselves in man's way, in man's traditions, rather than listening to the word of God. God has a plan. That's what this book is about, God's plan. Can you align with it, or are you stubborn? You got to do it your way? Then I would be very careful, my friend. These pillars will stand. And this 100, which is the symbol of God's election, or God's children of promise, he chose before the foundations of this earth, he can count on them. If you're one of them, he's not worried about you falling away. He's not worried about you being undisciplined. He's not worried about you being a wimp. He knows when that time, place, and instant comes by that the vengeance of God, as Christ is at the right hand of God until these enemies are placed under his feet, it's done by the election. And so it is, and so it shall be. Let's continue back in the, the 52nd chapter, next verse, please. And we go with verse 24. And the captain of the guard took Shariah and the chief priest and Zephaniah, meaning the hidden one, the second priest, and the three keepers of the door. He, he gathered them up and took them, 25. He took also out of the city an eunuch, supposed to be assisting the king's house, which had the charge of the men of war, little captain, and seven men of them that were near the king's prison, person, this would be keepers, which were found in the city. Well, how were they found there? Probably hiding out. Okay. And the principal scribe of the host, who mustered the people of the land, and three score men of the people of the land that were found in the midst of the city. They, they, had, they would not obey. They were hiding out, would not, would not adhere to the wishes of God or Nebuchadnezzar. And to hear Nebuchadnezzar was to hear God's word because God placed this upon us for a purpose, for a good purpose. Man cannot listen and man cannot learn. Discipline yourself in the word of God and know how the plan of God goes down and be at peace, because you're blessed when you do it God's way. Verse 26, 
So Nebuzaradan, this is to say Nebuchadnezzar's general down there, the captain of the guard took them and brought them to the king of Babylon to Riblah. 27, and the king and the king of Babylon smote them and put them to death in Riblah in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive out of his own land. Naturally, uh, think, think what um, happened earlier, even before this. This would be the third siege. But in the first siege, who was taken captive? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and, and, uh, and so forth. Where were they at this time? Going to college, eating well. They were obeying what God told them to do. And they would become upright citizens in Nebuchadnezzar's own country and town. That's to say Babylon. Prospered there. Did well. So those that rebelled, they were, they were killed. Now, if you wish to be blessed in the end times, if you wish to, to obey God, you see, his election, that's to say his children of promise, that 100, that's what it symbolizes, not an actual number, but, but uh, symbolically, the children of promise, that God has promised, stay with me, I will bless you. They will come forth, and they will prosper, and they will stand against the false one. And as we close in these next verses, you can actually see the vile person. That is to say, the second Nebuchadnezzar. That is to say, the second king of Babylon. When spiritually, that's none other than Satan himself. So God's not going to leave you unprepared. He's going to take you through and show you the way the way to happiness. You do not want to follow in the footsteps of these that went against God, went against his plan, and fell considerably short. Hamath is always present there. You know, even in Amos chapter 6, you, that's where the Kenites would dwell. Hamath and the, the, the bear that uh, Israel would not be blessed after the coming in of a nation that was braided, neither of the night, neither of the day, meaning the place of the Kenites. So they're always present there, so you don't want to overlook it. Satan's own little children, ready to see that wickedness is done to those that will not prevail with the living God. Verse 28. This is the people whom Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, properly, carried away captive in the seventh year 3,000 Jews, that's to say people living in Judea, and 3 and 20. So that's 3,000, 3 and 20, 23. Verse 29, in the 18th year, these are the various sieges, they would not listen. In the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons. And then we have the third. You know, three times and you're out. How long does it take for a person to see truth? How, how, how you, you can almost, you're amazed when you look at these people that were, were delivered by the enemy. Three different sieges it took. Each time saying, you're going to be okay here. You just take care of the land. We're putting you in charge. You gather the fruits and, and prosper. Then they couldn't handle it. They wanted, they wanted to go to, to Pharaoh and others. They could not obey. Even after God's word had come. So that's two of those sieges. Verse 30. And in the three and twentieth year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, that's the captain of the guard, carried away captive the Jews, 740 and five persons. All the persons were 4,600. That's how many were taken, even after uh, the total number. <clears throat> and so it was. That, that was God's plan. Verse 31, and it came to pass in the seven and thirtieth and, uh, year, 
of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, in the five and twentieth day of the month, that Ebel Murdoch, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiakim, this means he released him, king of Judah, and brought him forth out of the prison. Now, who, who is this evil Murdoch? Well, what does, what does this name mean? It's important that you know. It, it means a fool of death. How hard pressed would you be to know the replacement for the king of Babylon when time means nothing with their father, it, it means the second one that's coming is the fool of death, for his name is death. You, you don't have to be the sharpest blade in the drawer to figure that one out. Because as it is written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Christ came to this earth. He died on the cross to defeat death, which is the devil, Murdoch. So here you've got him. What, what, what was old Jehoiakim, sorriest of the kings? Only ruled three months. He went so bad that God even took away Jehoiakim and called him Jeconiah. And then, I mean, he, he was so bad, God totally removed his name from his name and called him Coniah. And here, Satan, don't, don't overlook this. Satan is taking the most evil of the lot and him number one. You don't want to go there. You don't want the fool of death to give you anything. You don't want anything of his, and you don't want to go anywhere where he is. The fool of death is none other than the son of perdition himself. As it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul picks up on this same subject. He said, you're looking for the second advent. Don't be deceived. It's not going to happen until after evil Murdoch, that is to say the son of perdition, stands in the holy place claiming to be God. See, this plan replays itself. You're going into captivity. You're going to be delivered up. The Holy Spirit is going to speak through you so that your misguided, mistaught relatives and friends in the world will have an opportunity to hear the real word of God, even in front of evil Murdoch, that is to say, son of perdition. Uh, he can't harm a hair on your head because you're a child of the living God. And as God himself, concerning this individual, who uh, this is a type, concerning this individual, he would tell him, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, hey, you can go down there and you can deceive <clears throat> all the people that have not the seal of God in their forehead. That means this letter, sealed in the mind, knowing what's going down. He said, you can't touch them and don't you dare try. So you see, he can't bother you. You're free. And it is a wonderful thing to be free in the king, because that's exactly what the truth does for you. It sets you free. You have no anxieties. You don't dread that day. You look forward to it. What, a, what an obligation and a duty to be able to serve the living God. So what does evil Murdoch do? This is the second king of Babylon. He takes the worst of the worst and makes them number one. Now, how is that going to make you feel? Well, I, I would be a little jealous. No, you won't. Because he, he is the pit of, of uh, deception and that that should not be coming out the gate. You want no part of it. That's why your father loves you enough he sent you this letter. It's why father loved Jeremiah enough that he chose him before the foundations of the world. Give him the prophecy to bring to you today, writing this letter, 
whereby Babylon can be destroyed and these jokers can be put away forever. And the real truth from the very mouth of Christ, though he's sitting at the right hand of God through the Holy Spirit, his voice will ring throughout the world, bringing forth the truth and guidance that this world needs. That's why God chose Jeremiah. That's why this book came forth. These particulars that more fully explain the end times and the reason for Jeremiah is a blessing indeed. A blessing to you to know you've got nothing to worry about. You don't care that Kaniah is placed number one. What kind of a deal would that be, you know? And um, bringing them forth. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 32. Concerning, he brought old Kaniah out, Jehoiakim, and he spake kindly unto him. Good buddy. He set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon. Do you know who that is? Well, who were the kings in Babylon? Have you ever read the book of Daniel? Daniel, number one, he put old Kaniah over them, and God said, you'll never rule in my house. Well, he certainly wasn't ruling in God's house. He was ruling in Satan's house. You don't want to go there, my friend. You never, never want to be deceived into falling for evil Murdoch, for his lies. When he builds people up, fancy, oh, I mean, hey, brings him right on up, brags on him, makes him number one. Number one, not in God's house, but in Satan's own house. You don't want part of Satan's house. Verse 33. And charged his prison, and changed rather his prison garments. And he did continually eat bread before him all the days of his life. Had it made. Had it made. You know, there's just one problem. That bread that he partook of, he sold out. He's not going to make heaven, most likely. I'm not the judge, and I'm not judging him. Who knows what will happen in the millennium? <clears throat> but there's one thing for certain. This is the bread you don't want. It's the bread of the false Christ. It's the bread of the king of Babylon of the end times. Making the evil number one, making that seem right which is wrong and that that is wrong seem right. It's just the word of God that's, that steers us, guides us, leads us, and lets us rise above and discipline ourselves in the word of God. When we see these things come to pass, we recognize them. Even today, as you learn from the book of Jeremiah, the swarming at the, book of the, the river Euphrates, look at it today. The swarming continues. Look at Syria swarm. Wake up. Listen to Father's word. Verse 34 to complete the book. And for his diet, there was a continual diet given him of the king of Babylon. Every day a portion unto the day of his death, all the days of his life. And his life wouldn't last long at that rate. Okay. But anyway, there you have the book of Jeremiah. And within that, the, the particulars explain more fully of how it goes down and the purpose of the book of Jeremiah. Preparing a people, the people of God's promise or their duties and what it is they are to do. Given the examples, taking those that were first taken in captivity, obeying God, look how God blessed them. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and so forth. Christ walked with them. When those three children were in the fiery furnace, Jesus himself walked with them. They, didn't, they did not suffer this lot of Kaniah of eating from the king's table, Babylon, evil Murdoch, the fool of death. They had no part of that. They obeyed God. 
And God blessed them, bringing forth the prophecies equivalent basically to Jeremiah's that teach us, lead us, and guide us in these end times to bring us to this truth. You know, Jeremiah suffered. He really did. I mean, he was let down into an old well, a cistern. He was mud up his, here, helped by two old straps cutting into his body, his flesh. Wow. Sent by God, no doubt let down old clothes and put under his armpits and reached a rope down and drug him out, brought him out safely and fed him and protected him. God always takes care of his own. There may be a little pain along the way there was for Jeremiah, but he didn't mind. Why? He was a prophet chosen by God, a prophecy that enables you in this generation to, to look around you and look at the world conditions for what has gone around comes around. And then you know your duties and you pray to the living God that he uses you, that he calls your name and you step forward, disciplined and ready to serve him. Book of Jeremiah, he whom God launches, has he launched you? Listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra-wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. Why? We've got to judge. It's our Father. He doesn't appreciate it when you start judging people. You do have the right to spiritually discern. Do you have that gift? If you do, it's a gift from God that lets you know what you should hear, what you should not hear. And it's a blessing from him, a gift. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, the, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, it's always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request, you don't need that number, you don't need an address, why God knows what you're thinking. Right now, he does. He created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Now, why he did that, I have no idea. Because he wanted somebody just like you, okay? Because he loves you. And he wants that love returned. If you want blessings, you will return that love. Let him know, talk to him, tell him and be blessed. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and we're going to go with Linda from Florida. Uh, I, I want to say I like how you explain how to tell the difference between about the false prophet or is it the Antichrist? Well, it, he serves both roles. Anyway, you basically said the elect and children of God should know this because our earthly bodies have not changed to the angelic body, that's to say the spiritual body. When Jesus Christ returns, his children and the elect would change in a matter of seconds. This was great. Thank you so much for explaining it. Uh, about the fallen angels who like to marry earthly women, how do you tell them apart from earthly men? They're supernatural, 
and you have uh, you have um, spiritual discernment. Their spirit is not our spirit. You will look in their eye, and you can see the wickedness and the evilness. It's like looking into a hole in the in the sky. They're not really at home, but anyway, they, they, yet they look very normal. But they have a very evil spirit. Thank you for your comments. Okay, Jack from Arkansas. When Father's people are delivered up before Satan, will these be the elect or the very elect or both, or will all the Father's children serving him on earth at that time be delivered up? No, just God's elect, because they're the only ones that know. You know, it, it is kind of a shame, but this is how you can spot God's elect. They know the false Christ comes first. As plain as it is written in the manuscripts, in the Word of God, it's still not taught. And people go to church, they sit on the pew, and they're never taught God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse to know the chronological order of events that God draws out to where a, children, a child can understand. And unfortunately, there's not that many. But all that know God will be delivered, uh, that know the, the false one. That is their destiny and purpose. God will use them and be thankful for them and bless them. Adam from New York. I heard you answer about going to heaven when a believer dies, that one will immediately go to heaven in a spiritual body and be conscious and aware. I was always led to believe one is not conscious at death, and the spirit goes back to God to await the resurrection. Why would I have to be resurrected if I am already was in heaven with a spiritual body. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5 and 10 says that the dead know nothing and there is no knowledge or wisdom when one dies. You see, ignorance is bliss, and I'm not calling you ignorant, but if you were to think that, not recognize that Ecclesiastes is written to the man that walks under the sun, that's your flesh body. Can't you see in chapter 9 where it says, a a living dog is better than a dead lion. It's talking about flesh. Okay. A lion's supposed to be king of the jungle, but if he's dead, he's just dead meat. He's going back to the dirt from which he came. Okay. And a living dog still has metabolism. And so it is with man. Once this flesh body dies, you're through with it. It goes back into the ground. It goes back to dirt. It knows nothing. Why? Because it's a chunk of dirt. But you have a beautiful spiritual body. You see, your spirit, as it reads in Ecclesiastes 12, 6, and 7, is your intellect of your soul, meaning your soul. Your soul goes with it. Have, have you never read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 35? You have two bodies. That's T-W-O. Two bodies. You have a flesh body and you have a spiritual body. The flesh body bites the dirt, goes back to dirt. The spiritual body returns to the Father from which it came. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord in the spiritual body. Period. God, if you read the last verses of chapter 8, the great St. John book, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Not even Satan is dead. He's right there behind, in heaven being helped by Michael. All of your ancestors that passed on, they're in paradise waiting judgment. Maybe some of them will go to hell, maybe some of them won't. But they're all there waiting for judgment. Uh, you don't need to be resurrected because you already have been. To be absent from this body is present with the Lord. First, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Ruth from Indiana. Pastor Murray, I enjoy listening to you teach the word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. My question, do you think if Satan repents that God will forgive him? Is there anything in the Bible about this? Thank you. O only enough that it mis some people misunderstand. It is written... In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 
uh, several verses into the chapter that don't marvel because Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light and don't marvel for his ministers, that's Satan's ministers, are also transformed into angel ministers of light. You see, there's just one problem the translators messed up. You with Strong's Concordances, you can fix it real easy. Take, take the word transformed and see what it really says in the Greek manuscript. You know what it says? Disguised. Don't marvel, for Satan comes disguised as an angel of light. He comes as Jesus Christ. That's why he's called Antichrist. And his little ministers, that's to say the people that pull for him, don't worry, they're disguised as, I come in the name of Jesus. There's just one problem. They never quite get around to teaching Jesus' word. So, no, Satan is doomed. He's already condemned to hell. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. He shall be turned to ashes from within. He has caused enough trouble that he's run out of chances in the first earth age over and over, and I'm sure many times we don't even know about. But God's through with him. Uh, Gary from Michigan, you often refer to the manuscripts. Where would one be able to obtain these manuscripts? We keep the greens in a linear, uh, both the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Aramaic. It gives you, not so much do I keep the greens in a linear for his translation, but so that you, as a student of the word, have an inexpensive set of manuscripts, the best you can come by, the very best. Uh, uh, and um, it gives you then the opportunity to have the actual language and to deal with it uh, through the Strong's Concordance and other ways to, to you can document whether something says a thing or not, okay? Anthony from North Carolina. Is it any truth in the saying, once saved, always saved? If so, what scripture supports this saying? Well, well it is true to this extent. Hebrews chapter 6. When you're saved, and you slide away, you backslide, don't say you're going to get saved again, because who does the saving? Christ does. If you say he's got to do it again, you're saying Christ failed. I would not advise you to do that because Christ doesn't fail. Okay. He put the salvation there for you and then he declared the law of repentance. Once you backslide, if and only if you repent, your salvation is reinstated do not repent and if you slide away from your salvation to the point you can go to hell so don't ever let anyone tell you different salvation is done by Christ he is not a failure but you can fail by slipping too far away through backsliding without repentance Marie from Texas why would some people say that Jesus got married and he have a had a family I know this is not so, but I would like to know, please. Because people listen to translators that are not Christian. That's why it's that simple. It is written in the manuscripts that, um, that Mary Magdalena was betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to a non-Christian, do you know what, to a Christian, do you know what that means? It means she was saved. She loved him and accepted him as Savior. We are all betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we Christians understand that terminology. A non-Christian scholar, higher critic, watch them. Because betrothed means married, or to be married. And they will translate it like, well, Mary Magdalena was married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they show their ignorance. They are not Christian. 
And this is why when you allow a non-Christian to do your translating, you're in a heap of hurt, my friend. That's why you want to be very careful of new translations. Very careful. I mean, you want to stay with where you have the tools to check it out for yourself and to understand from the very Word of God. Ruby from California, you have said we can and should pray silently because Satan can read our minds. I say pray out loud and let Satan know he is not in control. Uh, th th this is good, and I, and I like boldness, but you're misquoting me just a little bit. I said, if you, if you ever have a situation you're doing, maybe like I know a particular station I really want to buy time on, it's going to be a hard one to swing. And I know there are some people in that area that need to hear the Word of God. And I, I need a contract. Satan does not like for his God's word to go to any group if he can help it. Therefore, if you let it be known out loud until you get that contract signed, he's going to throw stumbling block after stumbling block, and when you're dealing with the secular world, those stumbling blocks hurt more because they will not reason necessarily with a Christian. So, you got to be wiser than the serpent, but as peaceful as a dove. I, I appreciate your gusto. Go for it. But success is what's important. You must be wiser than the serpent. Jane from California. If there was no law without Moses, why would the false worshipers punish by making a golden idol? Well, they, um, was Moses taken by God like Jesus? Well, he, God wouldn't let, as last chapter, Deuteronomy, God wouldn't let anyone bury Moses. He took him. Um, and um, what do you mean there wasn't any law? What did God say to Adam and Eve? He said, hey, you can go over here and, and you can eat any of these fruit trees. The word is et in the Hebrew manuscript. That's apples, oranges, whatever. You can, you can have all those you want. But do not, this is a law, do not partake of the fruit of the tree of the good and evil, which is not the tree of life, Christ, but Satan. Unfortunately, Eve partook of Satan. And there you go. So there was law long before Moses' law was given. God gave Moses the law. Patsy from Wyoming. When the Ark of the Covenant is in heaven, then how can the devil defile it? Well, he's there too. He's not going to defile it while it's there. You might say, well, how do you know it's in heaven? Well, I've read, I've read God's word. The last two verses of Revelation chapter 11 let you know where the Ark of the Covenant is, and you have fools that will still look for it here on earth. God takes care of business. That's the mercy seat, and um, he's on it. Daniel from Ohio. Where can I find the Bible passage that speaks about how there were other people on earth prior to Adam and Eve? Well, you read... You read chapter 1 of the book. He, he created Adam in the Hebrew tongue. That's humanity. And he told them to repopulate the earth because it was populated from before in the first earth age. Replenish it. He made part of them fishers and hunters. Gave them duties. And he looked at each and every one of them, all the races. He created them, and it was good. God is happy with the races. Don't ever apologize to your race in front of me. And then he rested the seventh day, and then he created Eth Ha'adam, different man in the manuscripts. And then brought forth Eve, and then created a bunch of domestic animals that Adam would use to farm the land. And so it is. That's where it's at. If you acquire the first six chapters of Genesis in video, 
I teach you from the manuscripts how to read that for yourself. Uh, it's, you can either take my word for it, but if you want to see it for yourself and learn how to read the Hebrew to document it, get the video on the first six chapters of Genesis. Sue from Kentucky. What happens to people between the time they die and Christ return? Then what until the great white throne judgment? Well, for right now, where are they? They're with the Father. They're in paradise. Jesus made this real plain in Luke chapter 16, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus, what was, he was poor. He was a beggar. Had nothing on earth, basically, to speak of, except his faith in the living God. But in paradise, he was in, with the bosom of embracing Abraham, was happy to see God, was, had overcome, he took part in the first resurrection, he was eternity bound. But the rich man was on the other side of the paradise, which means all go to paradise, why? To be judged, that's where God is. And certainly the rich man was in a state of degradation, we'll call it hell, not literally, but spiritually, because he didn't make it, he couldn't buy his way, he couldn't order it, he was doomed. But then, naturally, the good news is that the Lord's Day comes, and those that didn't have an opportunity to hear God's Word taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse, they're going to have a thousand years to hear. And on the first day of the millennium, every knee will bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. Eloise from Michigan. Is the word hallelujah in the Bible? Oh, many times. What does it mean first? See, you, this is where you would go wrong if you didn't know. It means praise ye the Lord. When you say alleluia. Now, in, in the Greek, you will find it in Revelation chapter 19 more than one time. Only instead of hallelujah, it is pronounced in the Greek al -a, alleluia. You'll find it in the 19th chapter of the great book of Revelation. But... Go, go, go into the Psalms. Go to Psalms, let me think, 135. And the very first word in the Hebrew manuscripts in that verse is hallelujah, which is to say, praise ye the Lord. Naturally, it's translated into English, praise ye the Lord. But that's hallelujah in the, the Hebrew tongue. Uh, Beverly from... Um, from... I can't, Florida, I guess, here. Um, question, should I keep looking for a church in my area, or do you think Shepherd's Chapel is sufficient for God? I, I would like to be baptized, but not, not at a church that preaches rapture and celebrates Easter. Can I do this myself uh, to be adequate to God? A Christian can anoint themselves uh, and... Um, if you, God will rec recognize many things when you have to do it, or if you ever come to Passover or Fall Fellowship, Beverly, you can be baptized here. So, uh, Shepherd's Chapel is a church. And when you sit in on one of our meetings, it's an extension of that church. And you're in the presence of God's Word when you study with Shepherd's Chapel. And um, so and so it is. God bless you. I'm proud of you. You're doing good. Uh, this would be <clears throat> Antoinette. Oh, okay. I got you. It's J Jacqueline. 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 I, I am. I am nine years old. I would like to know if I will be a fam. I will be a family with my parents and sister in heaven. Absolutely. Um, darling, do you know where you can document that, uh, Jaylene? Do you know where you can document it? It's real easy. You can document it in Ezekiel chapter 44. Read from verse 20 through 25, and you'll see that God's elect, while they're in the millennium, that's, that's heaven, so to speak. In the millennium, you can go to a mother, brother, sister, father, and so forth, meaning you will recognize your family, and you will be with your family. 
And so it is. And uh, I hope that puts you at ease. God bless you. We love you. Thanks for the question. Arthur from Georgia. Are the Canaanites, Ammonites, and Moabites the people of Russia today? No, no, no. Russia is Edom. That's red. It's Esau. Esau, you, you can read where Russia was formed in Genesis chapter 27. Only it's a little bit mistranslated. It says off the fat of the land. It means away from the fat of the land will you settle. And that's why that they are so far north that they can't make decent crops and everything. It was established and set in the very word of God. Jimmy from California, what scriptures tell us that Satan is not on earth now? but that he was, has spiritual helpers doing his work, it's, it's uh, evil spirits. He's, he's locked in heaven. Christ said, get behind me, and he's being held in heaven as it is written in um, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. That's when Michael get, and his angels throw Satan and his angels out onto this earth in the role of false messiah. That's not going to be all that long away. Be ready for it. I'm out of time. Hey. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but most of all, God loves you for it. Make, when you make, do that, you make His day. And when you make God's day, you've got a blessing coming. You can count on it. He loves you. Return that love to Him. Once you do that, that's why He sent you this letter. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we have helped you. You help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, he will always bless you. Most important, though, I want you to listen to me, and I want you to listen good. You stay in his word. Every day, in his word, it's a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The book of Peter, here we have two books, First and Second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman, telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman, which in his gentleness and his kindness brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them.
From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to complete discernment. That's something you really must become skilled at, especially in this generation. That is to be able to discern good from evil, good spirit from bad spirit, good advice from bad advice, to discern which road you take in life. And God sent along a road map 